Well, praise the Lord. You believe the Lord's good, say amen. amen. Then we know one thing, that the Lord is all good, because in Him is no shadow of turning, no darkness nor perverseness of any kind. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Isn't that so? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we just praise you and thank you, Lord, for your word tonight. Thank you, Father God, for opening our eyes and preparing us, Father God, that we might receive your word, the revelations of your word, Father God. We hear strongly in our spirits, Father, the, the words of Jesus that we are to go forth and to do his sayings. He tells us not to be hearers only, but doers of the word. And we thank you for that, Father God. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. They always ask me what the name of this message is. So I'll tell you the message tonight is named The Roots of Joy. So, if you will, turn with me to Romans 1 if you want to. Got lots of scriptures this evening. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated under the gospel of God, which he had promised before by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son Jesus our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead, by whom we have received grace and apostleship, for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom you also are called of Jesus. To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness whom I serve, with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers, making request, if by any means now at length I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. For I long to see you, that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift, to the end that you might be strengthened, established or means strengthened, that is, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith both of you and me. Now I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purposed to come unto you, but was led hereunto, that I might have some fruit among you, even as among other Gentiles. I am a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. And so much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, and is written, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Now, I read all that to let you see here that uh, there is a purpose and when it tells us here about that Jesus is declared the Son of God with power, we know that he's also the firstborn of many brothers, of which you are the followers after Jesus. And it says that, 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 that Jesus is noted for the power of God be, being in him. And that's what you're to be noted for, the power of God, the being in you. The many times that we'll get to a place to where the, the enemy will come to us and he'll, he'll start talking in our ear. Sometimes he'll use other Christian people or, or worldly people or whatever he can get, whoever he can get to talk to you. He'll get them to talk to you and just to get, try to get you to doubt whether or not that power resides in you or not. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit is like the wind. You can't see the wind. You can't see the Holy Spirit because he's a spirit. But just as you can see the wind blow, the trees will bend, the leaves will fly, 
you can tell that the wind is blowing. Well, God has made ways for which you can see the effects of the Spirit. And it's meant to establish you, to strengthen you, and to comfort you. You, you see what I'm saying? Most of the time we think about uh, healing other people, getting other people well, uh, getting other people out of trouble, getting other people prosperous, getting other people saved, whatever. <laughs> we don't think too much about what it does to us or what it's supposed to do to us. But it is supposed to have an effect on you. And that is how tonight I'm, I'm hoping to show you that truly we have the roots of joy within us. If we've been born again and we believe that Jesus is the Christ and that God raised him from the dead, the Bible says that we're saved. And Jesus told us, he said, if we will uh, receive the Holy Ghost, he said, then power would come upon us. And I used to always say, every time I would preach about that, I would always say, any of you show me one lie that Jesus told? You know one lie that Jesus told? He never told a lie. He's not a man that he can lie. You follow what I'm saying? So whenever the Bible tells us that uh, God is going to do something, it's going to happen. The only way it won't happen is that if you don't want it to happen. But if you want it to happen, it'll happen. It's just that easy. Now, just turn with me if you would, or else I, you can just wait, I'll read it to you. Mark 16. Most of you know all this by heart. If he wasn't filming it, I wouldn't be going through all this. I, I know you know it. He said in verse 15th verse of Mark 16, Go you into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick. And they shall recover. So then after that, the Lord had spoken unto them. He was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. Now, those signs following and the evidence that the Lord has been with us is supposed to do something for you. It's supposed to bless you. It's supposed to keep you strong. It's supposed to keep you lifted up and comforted. I remember one time there was a man came to our house. He was a preacher. And he had got out of the word and, and, and got the worldly and he got to the place where he didn't want to be a preacher anymore, but he had a church. And he had a, a part of a congregation and, and he had uh, debts, a little bit of money, mostly debts. But he was hook, looking for somebody to uh, take that burden off of his hands. He felt it was a burden. And uh, people were talking to him and telling him that he wasn't called of God and, and this and that, and he believed him. So anyway, when he came into our house, we didn't know what he wanted, but uh, my wife can remember this. We were sitting there, and he was uh, just feeling me out and talking to me, and the phone rang. And I answered the phone. I was sitting right beside the phone. I answered the phone, and there was a guy on the other end of the phone. He asked me, was I Pastor Pogue? I said, yes. He told me who he was. I said, what could I do for you? He said, I want to be saved. I want you to tell me how to be saved. I said, that's easy. And I went through and told him how to be saved. If a man believes in his heart, the Lord Jesus, that God has raised him from the dead, that I shall be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And I said, if you're sincere about being saved and wanting to be part of the family of God, God will hear you. God will receive you. There'll be a miracle take place in your life. You'll have a new spirit. You'll feel the old burden lift off of you. You'll feel lighter. You'll, you'll have a wonderfulness about you, and you'll be able to tell the difference. So we prayed over the telephone, and sure enough, he received his salvation. 
It's quoted back to me everything I said. He felt all those things. All those things happened just like I said. And the man sitting there, the, there he said, I've seen all I need to see here. And he gave us the church. We ended up, we sold the church and paid off all these bills and made everything right with the people, pr protected and preserved the name of Jesus in that neighborhood as best we could for him. But you see, he had to see the tree bend from the wind blowing. He had to see a sign to him. There's lots of people have to see signs. They want to see, they want to know. Do you follow what I mean? Our whole life is to be a testimony to them. Jesus called us for us to be a witness unto the world. And if we're a witness unto the world, then there's, there's trees blowing, there's leaves blowing, there's all those things when the spirit moves or when the wind blows. I'm speaking metaphorically of the spirit. When the spirit moves, there's things that happen in your life. Not only is it supposed to convince them, and not only is it supposed to do that, it's supposed to glorify the name of Jesus, and, but it's also supposed to establish and strengthen you to be able to do that. I know many times there was uh, people that uh, had all kinds of trouble. And they would call, and uh, we would pray for them. Uh, sometimes that the Borough of Chambersburg Police Department would call and say, come down here. We have somebody down here that has to see you right away. I'd go down there, and there'd be somebody that is trying to commit suicide or trying to do something like that, some bad thing all, every time I went down there. And we wouldn't be down there very long talking about Jesus, and it would change them around, change their life, and, We'd walk them out of there and everything would be fine. And, and, and then people would shake their head and say, there surely is a God in heaven. <laughs> Why was that? They saw the tree bend. They saw the spirit move. They saw the way that things were going on. And when I started, first started to be a preacher, I, I never went to a preacher school. I, did, I, I, I went right from being a bartender to being a Christian. And then I went to church. I got saved in a bar. Then I went to church. And when I got to church, I found out that they were good-hearted people, wonderful people, but the preacher didn't know, he didn't know how to uh, minister to the saved. He knew how to minister to the lost. He was an evangelist stuck in a preacher pulpit. And he would constantly get his congregation saved every Sunday morning. The altar would be full, including me. I would go up there, and the Lord started to speak to me and say, well, are you saved or not? If you're saved, you're saved. Why are you going up there? Well, I smoked a cigarette. Because then preacher would stand up there and say, if God wanted you to smoke, you put a chimney on your head. All that kind of stuff. I mean, he had all them sayings. And, but the thing about it is that after a while, I saw that if I was going to do the scriptures, if I was going to be a Christian and, be the, and do the call that I felt God was calling me to do, I couldn't listen to that anymore. I had a hard time getting my family out of that because that was the family church. But I, I did get them out. But after we got them out, and I started to gather up a little congregation at my house on the couch, I think Brother Butch was the first one on my couch. And then we started to gather up, and then, and then we had enough we, too big for our little living room. We, had, we moved into a bigger living room, and then we moved into the East Point Tavern. And when we got bigger than that, we moved over to Reverend Scott's old church. But anyway, I got to this point to where I wondered, Lord, am I doing the right thing? I started to feel responsibility for people. I thought, am I, am I doing the right thing? And the devil would speak in my ear and say, you're just playing church. You ain't never been to school and all those things. Those things go on in everybody's life in one way or another. So anyway, I, I grew up in the age when Oral Roberts had a big healing ministry. And my mother listened to him frequently every time she could over the radio. 
And me being a kid living there in the house, I heard Oral Roberts' messages. I heard about the people that were miraculously healed and all those things. And I thought to myself, well, God's no respecter of persons. Then if, if, if God is using Oral Roberts to heal people, why wouldn't he use us to heal people? So I started to preach and teach about healing and, and saying about how I believe God wants, to, wants everybody to be well. I got to searching the scriptures. The Bible said, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have life. And I found out God didn't want us sick. He had no purpose at all for us being sick. He didn't want to teach us nothing by it. He had other ways to teach us. He didn't use the world's way and the devil's way. But I, up until that point, everybody that I knew all thought that if they were sick, God was, they'd done something and God was correcting them and straightening them out. But that isn't the case. But when we started to believe in uh, of uh, being led by the Holy Spirit and, and, and preaching the way God would have us to preach and teach the lessons that he would have us to, to do, opportunities to be right or wrong started showing up in church. Doc come to the door and, and the, the pastor from the Franklin County Prison brought a guy in here and said, here, he said, He's been, I took him to two or three other churches. He's not a fit there. But they all recommended we bring him down here. You're, you, you're, you know all about these kind of people. This guy will be a fit for you. Bring him in. Well, we brought him in. He had a wife that was in the hospital. It was a girlfriend then, but he married her later. But it was a girlfriend, and, and she had a, uh, I forget what all was wrong with her, uh, some kind of tumors or something in her. And that Sunday, right after church, he had me by the hand. He drug me to the Chambersburg Hospital to pray for that girl. Well, I prayed for her, and it wasn't very long. She's out of the hospital and started coming to church. And, and uh, I started looking for ways. I, I knew whenever she started showing up in church, she had a lot of obvious things wrong with her. She had a club foot, wore a brace on her leg. She had a uh, big Coke bottle Type lenses. Most of you people that were there remember her, know who I'm talking about. And she had big, two big hearing aids, one in each ear. She couldn't hardly hear. She couldn't hardly see. And I thought, Lord, I bit off maybe more than I can chew. <laughs> I'm just being plain out and telling you the truth. I got to wondering, but, you, but I was listening the whole time to R.W. Shambaugh. I was listening to R.W. Shambaugh, Charles Capps, and, and uh, people that, that they, they were preaching power, power messages, and uh, wonderful things was happening. People were bringing dead babies into R.W. Shambaugh's church and handing them to him, and he'd hand them back alive. <laughs> I mean, all kinds of stuff. I was listening to all that, and I thought, whoo, how am I ever going to do that? You follow me? I, got, I started getting worried and afraid and saying, Man, Lord, don't let nothing like that happen in here. <laughs> but the more I, I started looking around, and I saw in James 5, 14, where the Bible says, there's any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church. I said, mm, why did he put that in there? <laughs> but the Bible said, if he call on the elder of the church, let him pray the prayer of faith, anoint him with oil, and the Lord would lift him up. And if it be any sin, it would be forgiven him. And I said, I bet he means exactly what he's saying there. It ain't up to me to heal him. It's only up to me to pray for him and anoint him with oil and encourage him. And even sin can't stop that prayer. I started to get a little bold. I was baptized in the Holy Ghost. Old Robert's pastor was uh, Bob DeWeese. He came to our church one time. There was only 17 people in our church. When the church service, he was there. Three of us went up to the altar. We all went up the altar. We all got baptized in the Holy Ghost. I was one of them. And I didn't know it at the time, but when I got baptized in the Holy Ghost, the Lord called me out to preach. But you don't know all that. You don't see all that stuff when it happens. You just, you're just going along with it. You just you doubt it yourself, mostly. I did. Anyway, so one Sunday morning, I started talking about elder prayer 
I thought, as soon as I lay this out there, I bet you she's going to get up. Sure enough, I talked about the altar prayer. Boom, up she come. I said, what can the Lord do for you, sister? She said, I want this brace off my leg. I thought, well, God said, if I anointed you with oil and pray the prayer of faith, prayer of faith will save the sick, the Lord will raise them up, if be any sin, and be forgiven them. Remember now, I wasn't more than six months from a bar room at this point. But I thought to myself, it ain't going to be none of this putting a few drops on the forehead. He said, anoint him with oil. I poured it on. <laughs> I wasn't missing no nothing. I was putting it on. I poured the oil on her, on her head and prayed the prayer of faith. And she walked over to the couch and, or to the chair, front chair, and sat down, started unbuckling her buckles. I said, holy smokes, look at this. <laughs> she took a brace off. Even with the brace on, her foot was like that. When she took that brace off, her foot went boom, right back straight. Right back, there's witnesses that can tell you. From then on, she never, ever wore a brace again. And following Sunday, I was all puffed up. I said, man, we're ready now. <laughs> We had a good service. We was preaching Jesus and preaching him crucified and, and talking about the goodness of the Lord. And, and that's what we majored in was the goodness of the Lord. We was against all that other sin and condemnation. I saw how that ruined me and dampened down my spirit and made everybody leave, eventually leave the church. I saw how bad that was. And I said, I don't, I don't really understand it all, but I know that ain't right. I ain't going that way. I'm going to the goodness of the Lord. We just bathed them people in the goodness of the Lord. Just kept preaching the goodness of the Lord, the goodness of the Lord. Next Sunday when we come time for the altar call, or for the, the uh, elder prayer, here she come again. She came up there, and I used to see her when she would go to sign a check. She lived on disability, disability checks. She had a big old round magnifying glass plus them Coke bottle glasses and she would get like this here and she would write them letters like that. I'd see her turn her head like that, trying to, trying to see with all that magnification. That didn't worry me a little bit. When she got up there, I prayed it again. She took them glasses off and could see from that day on. I didn't do nothing. Said, pour the oil on her head and pray the prayer out of prayer. But the thing that I preached and the thing that I believed, that there is a river of God. Amen. But it's you. Every river don't start out being a river. It starts out being a stream. One stream flows into another stream. Another stream tributary joins another. And then another stream flows in. And all together they make a river. And whenever the Lord says, come to the river, or bring him to the river, we're, you're the river. Amen. We're the river. And we, when the people would come, they came to us as a body of Christ on Black Avenue. They came to us looking for God, looking for healing, looking for whatever they needed. And God would show up and they would get healed. The third time that lady came up, she got her hearing aids out. I wasn't sweating them at all. But by that time, I was about nine feet tall in the spirit. Why? I was getting established. I was being strengthened by the Lord. You remember? My whole life, fear has always been my problem in my whole life. That's why I was so dangerous in the bars. You mess around with me, I got you right now. I didn't wait. I didn't catch you outside. I got you right there. I don't care what happened. I tell everybody, don't you get nowhere close to me if you're talking to me like that. Because they get anywhere close to me, that was it. Boom. Down they'd go. That's all because of fear. But I found out that courage is doing things even though you're afraid. 
Do you understand what I'm saying? And I found out that when you're in with the Lord, you don't have to be afraid. Because He's doing the work. All you're doing is praying. All you're doing is believing. All you're doing is teaching and the preaching. All you're doing is the exhorting and the prophesying. All you're doing is things like that that anybody can do that's saved and baptized in the Holy Ghost. Anybody can do that. You follow what I'm saying? I went to a lady's house one time. When I walked in, my mother got me the appointment to go. My mother worked for her. She was really rich. The dear in this town. Owned a big dealership. My mother had been talking to her for years about how wild and crazy I was and she didn't know what she's ever going to do, how they couldn't get me to go to church and all this and all that. And she heard my mother talking like that. And then all one day my mother said, Georgie got saved. Her boy got saved. She couldn't understand it. And after bed, my mom saw that there was something there. And so she made a point with me to go see this woman. And when I went in there, I took a, another brother along out of the church, and we went in there to see her, and, and uh, she had hearing aids, but could hear a little bit. But she could hear better with her hearing aids. I was just sit down and started explaining to her the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and what happens, how you receive that, and what she could expect in her life. And the fact that she was in her late 60s, God didn't care. God wondered no matter if she was 99. He wanted her. And this woman had been sorely abused and, and misused and mistreated and had no confidence or, or trust in anything or anybody. But when I started telling her about the Lord, the fact that my mother had built me up to her, she had hope. So when I gave her the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, just, just as I was getting to the point I was telling her about confessing the Lord Jesus and praying the prayer, her hearing age went flat. And she lost every bit of her hearing. Just like that. I could tell by looking at her there was something wrong. I said, what's wrong? She didn't know what I was saying. I took a piece of paper and wrote, what's wrong? She wrote the paper back, I can't hear. I said, you can't hear? I said, don't your hearing aids work? She said, no. I said, I swallowed hard to do this. But I said, do you mind if I lay hands on you and pray for you? She said, that's fine. I laid both hands, one on each side of her ear, and my buddy laid his hands on top of my hands, and we prayed in the name of Jesus, commanded that ear to come. She saw her perfect from then on. You think that was anything I did? I didn't do that. I didn't do anything. I hadn't done any of those things. Who did that? God did that. Why did he do that? That was the purpose that he got me saved in a bar. That's the purpose he got you saved. He got you saved to be a witness to the nations. He got you saved to, to tell people about the Lord. You follow what I'm saying? I'll tell you what else to you. Even when you start out, you might be as crude as crude can be. And you might get rebuffed a time or two. But I'll tell you, if it's really in your heart and you keep it up, he'll smooth you out. He'll show you how. And he'll bring people to you that'll be easy. And pretty soon you'll get a big string of people that you showed them the way to the Lord. And they received the Lord. Now let me tell you something. If I pull a switch into my car and my headlights comes on, you can bet there's some electricity between the switch and that light. And you get somebody saved, you can bet there's some power between you and that person. When I read back here, Bob Paul was talking about he wanted to uh, rejoice and have fruit with these people, uh, all these people, because they were people that he had influenced to get saved. And he got around them, and that fruit built him up, and made him feel good. He liked that. He liked to teach him things. So anyway, that's the kind of thing that went on, and I couldn't explain any of it except for what it was happening, and I, and I believed it was the thing to do. And at the, all during this time, when I would tell people that I was saved, they'd say, you ain't one of them tongue talkers, are you? I said, yep. <laughs> they said, well, you're one of them holy rollers. You guys are of the devil. My preacher preached on that last Sunday. 
Every one of you guys is crazy. That's exactly what they would tell you. That's a little hard to swallow. Do you understand what I mean? To you, I look at him and I say, you preacher, get anybody saved lately? You get anybody healed lately? I did. We did. The church did. There's people coming in all the time doing that. Now, one of the things that you're always going to get is persecution in the world if you're carrying the power of God in your life. Amen. Things are going to happen. You'll get to where you think you're smooth sailing, all of a sudden something will jerk the rug out from under you. But the thing you got to do is just keep falling back onto God, just keep falling back onto God, because that persecution that is rising for the word's sake is a testimony to you that you're on the right track. You understand what I mean? Pretty soon you'll learn how to handle that. And you'll get on with it pretty good. Okay, now, turn with me to Acts chapter 1. What time am I supposed to be done? No, I'm going to quit when I'm supposed to. Here in Acts chapter 1, Jesus is talking to John and the disciples, and he's, he, <coughs> he said, or to, uh, he's telling them about, for John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost for many, not many days hence. And then he says, when they therefore we come together, they ask of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? And he said unto them, It's not for you to know the times nor the seasons which the Father has put in his power. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and into the uttermost parts of the earth. Now, I've told a lot of people about Jesus being a Christian or Jesus being a Savior and that they needed to be a Christian. And... I got rebuffed. They wouldn't want nothing to do with it. They, when I would bring up, when I would bring up the name of Jesus and about being saved, they would bring up some bad thing that they know that happened in a church somewhere, or they had some family member that was bad, or they knew some preacher that fell by the wayside, or they knew something. You always got that. Well. <laughs> I got to see in what that verse 8 is here, but ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witness unto me both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and at the uttermost parts of the earth. When the word starts getting around about people being saved and people being comforted by you and people being delivered from darkness through you and through the Lord ministering through you and people start being healed and, and all kinds of things like that. When people start hearing that, that word gets around. And when that word gets around, that's the witness that he's talking about here. That's the, that's the power of the Holy Ghost which came upon you and made you a witness unto all those things. People heard about it. You follow what I mean? This is the reason why we're supposed to exhort one another and prophesy to one another. If you come to me and start telling me about a bad day or about you don't think it's worth going on or all those kinds of things, I'm supposed to cheer you up. I'm supposed to exhort you, comfort you, and, and teach you how to get over that and how to handle that and how to draw courage and keep on keeping on. Because the devil, if he can, he's going to stop you. Because if you find out what's really going on and become a part of that, you're his biggest threat. You follow what I'm saying? So anyway, the Holy Ghost is the secret to doing these kinds of things. Without the Holy Ghost, you might do a few little things, but you ain't going to do big things for the Lord without the Holy Ghost. 
I don't think you'll stay very long without the Holy Ghost. Anyway, turn with me, if you would, to Acts 2. Verse 38 and 39. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remissions of sin, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children, to all them that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward, this crooked generation. And they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Now, let me tell you a little bit about Peter. It ain't been a very couple of days before this that, Painter, that Peter denied Jesus, denied even being a part of Jesus. Isn't that right? Jesus told him he was going to end up doing that three times before the cock crowed, right? And he did. Yet here he is. Now he has just preached this message. Uh, here in, in Acts, he's preached this message and has got over 3,000 people saved with one message. That's pretty good work. What was the difference? The Holy Ghost. He had the power of the Holy Ghost in him. You follow what I'm saying? And he was letting it come out. What was that? What was, how did that power of the Holy Ghost demonstrate itself? It lifted up the name of Jesus. It started bringing people to the name of Jesus. And as the people came, they just, the devil couldn't do nothing about it. The Bible says that God lifted up his word even above his name. Yet, yeah. in the name of Jesus, we sang about it tonight, is lifted higher than anything, any name on the earth, in the earth, none of the earth. But he lifted his word up even above his name. When Peter spoke the word in this message here, it was just like Jesus himself standing there preaching. You follow what I'm saying? When you're talking to somebody in the lunch break room at work, it's just like Jesus is sitting there talking to them. If they're confiding in you and drawing from you and getting comfort from you and you're blessing them with, with the love of God and 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 demonstrating the love of God towards them. It's the same as Jesus sitting there doing it. Isn't that right? The same water that's in the spring that made the run, that made the creek that ended up in the river, it's the same water the whole way through. You understand what I mean? It's the same water. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead now dwells in you. You follow what I'm saying? The same spirit that was in this church that raised people from the dead, that opened blind eyes, that set the captives free, that straightened crippled legs, that brought mar marriages back together. Uh, it's, it was the same as if the one that Jesus uses. It's the same. I mean, there wasn't anything that this little congregation couldn't do. We had a woman whose husband left her. And she was bound and determined. She wanted him. She wasn't letting him go. Matter of fact, she had been told, hey, kick him to the curb. You some God to get you somebody better. Did you ever hear that? <laughs> she was bound and determined. She wasn't letting go. She came in every testimony time and you got a chance to testify in the church. She'd get up and testify. Thank God. I, I asked the Lord. He gave me the answer to my prayer. My husband's coming home. He's on his way back. Sure enough, he was due to get married. Wasn't he? He had another woman who was due to get married. On the day of the wedding, he changed his mind, didn't get married, and walked into her house. And she brought him to church. God did that. He did it because that woman wouldn't take no for an answer. <clears throat> you follow what I mean? She just said, I believe in Jesus. God's going to take care of me. He promised. Well, nothing too hard for God, what she said. Isn't that right? All right. Now, 
In Hebrews 11, I only got about 10 minutes. I got to get moving. I'm going to read these couple of scriptures. Now, you've all heard these scriptures a million times, and I know you know them. But I'm going to read them again because I want to show you a few things. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen are not made of things which do appear. That verse right there, I want you to see that the thing that doesn't appear that you can't see is the Word. It's the written Word of God. The Bible just told us right before it, by the Word of God, the worlds were framed by the Word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. The things that you can't see is the Word. You can read it, but you can't see it. Faith will make you see it. Faith will bring that word so you, so you can see it. You can't tell the winds out there till the tree bends. You follow what I'm saying? No. By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see God, and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. What pleases God? Faith. It pleased God that that little girl got that, that little Indian. She was a half-blood Cherokee Indian. It pleased God that she got that brace off her leg. It pleased him that she got the hearing out of her, or got the things out of her ears so she could hear, and got... Her eyes fixed so she could see it pleased God at that. It pleased God that that woman could hear the gospel and give her heart to the Lord, which she did at 66 years old. It pleased God that a woman came in this church and was with us for a while, and then she went blind from sugar diabetes. We believed the elder prayer, and we believed the circle of love. There'd be only maybe 10, 15 people here. We'd get together in a circle of love and I'd say, who feels like praying tonight? Why did I say that? Because we're the river. The power laid in here. Power didn't lay in me. It laid in this body. And I'd say, how many of you feel like praying tonight? Maybe two or three of the ladies would say, I'll pray. Somebody else say, I'll pray. One of them was the lady that got her husband back. She said, I'll pray. We put that woman in that circle of love and prayed for her. Nothing happened. She went out of that circle just as blind as she went in. I didn't understand it. We couldn't stay here all night. We went home. Next Sunday she came back. We got to uh, having church and come time for uh, the, uh, in the evening we had that elder prayer again. That, that circle of love. We put her in again the next week. I asked for three people to pray. Three people got in there and prayed. I always was the fourth one and would pray the last one. And she went out just as blind as she went in. Well, she didn't come to work the next week, come to church the next week, but the following week she came, came to church again, blind, still blind. We stuck her back in that circle. Why? We believe in prayer. We believe in what Jesus said. I didn't know why she wasn't getting it there, but I know what Jesus said was right. What else did we have? We believed what the Word said. And if you believe in prayer, you don't stop praying just because you don't see it. You keep on praying. You follow what I'm saying? The third time we stuck her in that prayer, you remember that, Sister Diane? The, the, we stuck her in that prayer, and I forget who all prayed that night, but there's, I think, Sister Lisa and Sister... I don't know who all they were. There was three of them. Got in and they prayed, and I prayed with them. And she could see. Why couldn't she see the second time? I don't know. Why couldn't she see the first time? I don't know. She could see that third time. If it works and you love God and you love her, keep after it. She was important. 
Isn't that right? That little girl, Indian girl that come up and had all those things happen at the altar, come up there one day, and she said, you know, I have a colostomy. I went, mm -hmm. <laughs> I wasn't going to show her no unbelief, but I was swallowing hard. <laughs> she said, I want to pray. She said, I want to pray. She said, that thing's embarrassing to me. I can't, I can't, uh, do the things I need to do, want to do. She said, I, I, I just, I want to pray. If God could heal my foot, if he could heal my eyes, if he could heal my ears, I said, he can heal that colostomy. But the whole time the devil said, you've done her now. You've done her now. We got her in there and started praying, prayed the elder prayer, dumped the oil on her head, praying the elder prayer to her, and she went out of there like nothing happened. She called me up the middle of the week. She said, guess what? I said, what? She said, I just got a letter from Cleveland Clinic. They're going to reverse colostomies. They think they can reverse my colostomy. They want to know if I'll come and be one of the first ones to ever have a colostomy reversed. I said, take them up on it. <laughs> Don't you think that wasn't God? She went to Cleveland Clinic. They reversed her colostomy. Man, I'm telling you, if that don't, if that don't puff you up, I'll tell you, it lights your fire, your wood's wet. Something. <laughs> Now, why do you think that happened? The Bible says in Galatians, it says this. I'm running out of time. I'm going to end with this. The Bible says in Galatians, why don't I just read it to you? <laughs> I could quote it to you, but let me read it to you. You'll like to read this. Chapter 3, verse 1. O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth, crucified among you? This only would I learn of you. Received you the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now made, being made perfect in the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in faith? If it be yet in vain, he therefore that ministers to you the Spirit and worketh miracles among you, does it he it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Now think about that. He didn't do any of those things because any one of us in here was a goody good two shoes. He did it because we heard the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we heard about faith. And we heard it pleased God. And we heard that God had no reason or no wanting of any kind to have us sick, injured, poor, helpless, or anything. We believed that God wanted for us life and life more abundantly. He said, Dearly beloved, I wish above all that you be prosperous and in health, even as your soul prospers. Well, anybody in here couldn't quote them scriptures. We heard all that. We believed all that. And God was doing all those things through that, not through any one of us. Yeah, I mean, he was using us, using the whole congregation. Those people, the three was praying, don't you think the other six or seven in the, in, they were standing there holding hands in to make the circle? Don't you think they were part of that prayer? Don't you think the few that were sitting over here in the chair or over there who hadn't become a part of that, don't you think they were still a part of it? Yes, they were. You follow him? How? By the hearing of the faith of the word, by being Receiving the Spirit just by faith. Isn't that right? The Bible said that Noah, after he heard from God, decided to build an ark and save his family. Why? Well, God told him, he said, it's going to rain. There's going to be a terrible flood. You better get you an ark built. Listen to me, do it how I tell you to do it, and you can save you and your family, and I'll save other stuff. He brought all the animals in. How many of you ever thought about this? This is the truth. It had never rained on the earth till that day. Never. Not one drop of rain had ever fallen on the earth. And here's a man believing it's going to rain and make a flood and cover the whole earth. How do you think he did that? You think he did that in the natural? That was an impartation of the Holy Spirit right there to make that man be able to do that. 
The man said, hey, God said it. God, not a man, he can lie. I'm going to worship God. I don't care what happens, but I'm going to worship God. I'm going to do what God said no matter what. I've failed at that. I've had people come to me and say, Pastor, would you pray for me? I say, I'll keep you in my prayers. That ain't what they wanted. What they wanted was me to grab them, boy, slap the wall on them and rub their head till the hair flies off and say, God, in the name of Jesus, give them what they want. Why didn't I do that? Fear started sneaking back up in my life and showing up in fear of rejection. You understand what I'm saying? It's a daily battle. You've got to continually eat on the word and, and, and be a... Jesus said, don't fail to join yourselves together even in the manner as some is in these end times, but so much more in these end times. Keep coming to church and being around one another and hearing things from one another. Keep yourself stirred up in the power of the Lord. Because I'll guarantee you there's enough power in every one of you sitting here that believes in the name of Jesus right now. There's enough power in every one of you to open blind eyes, change, cloth, do the whole works, whatever is needed. It's there. It's there. You can't stop because the first half a dozen times you tried it, it doesn't work. If you believe it, you believe it. You just keep after it. What if you say, well, what if it don't happen until the Lord comes? Well, then you got the testimony. You were still working on them when the Lord comes. You're getting credit for it anyway. Isn't that right? Did you learn anything? Praise the Lord. Had all them scriptures. You only got three. <laughs> well, praise the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that every time the pastor comes up here, and lays hands on somebody and they receive the Holy Ghost. Lord, let the church rejoice. Let us jump up and down and dance and holler and rejoice, Father God, at the power of the living God that flowed through our pastor and saw the Holy Ghost come upon that man, Father God. Lord, we just praise you for the transference of power in the lives of people, Lord. We give you praise and honor and glory, Father God, for I know, Lord, tonight the devil didn't want anybody to hear this. He don't want people praying in the Holy Ghost. Father God, I know that praying in the Holy Ghost builds us up on our most holy faith. It excites faith and gets us eager to work our faith and gets us eager to do the things of God, Father God. And I praise you, Father God. Praying in the Holy Ghost will cause us to not to want to sin but, and to want to serve God. Father God, the devil loves to, treat, to uh, make fun of us and, and, and jeer us about the Holy Ghost, but the Holy Ghost and the baptism of the Holy Ghost and praying in tongues today is just as real, Father God, as the air that breathes outside, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you, Lord.